Okay there, Dr. Charles Karuku. I'll tell you what, we are going live again with this teaching on Yom Kippur. And um, I'm going to be bringing in Brother Mike Rose here in just a moment. I know it has been a pretty rough, difficult time getting him on. Uh, we've been running into some technical difficulties, but I'll tell you what, thank you for your patience because uh, we are going to get this done and i believe the lord will be glorified so if you are joining me tonight i we are going to be talking about yom kippur and the feasts of the lord and uh, you're going to love it because this is going to to help help you gain a lot of understanding about the times we are in and the season that we are in. Amen. Finally, Shalom. Shalom. Praise God. Shalom, Shalom. Let me tell you, Shalom, Shalom. Let me tell you a little story about this particular sermon. Yeah. I have given this sermon two times at IOC, and both times we had technological technical difficulties. One time the sound went off at a time when I was explaining why the Christian church doesn't represent or doesn't even understand this feast. One, and incidentally, you weren't there either those two times. You were traveling, and I was, I was giving you your Sunday, Sunday, uh, Sunday sermon. I tried giving this. Actually, I did give this sermon on Saturday night, and Facebook would not let me log on. It took me over a half an hour to get logged on, and then the message got interrupted five times during the message. <laughs> but for some reason, I usually have my phone turned the opposite way, but for some reason, I forgot my mirror so I could actually see how, what was going on, and I was forced to turn it this way, portrait size. And good thing it did, because that what the Lord told me, the Lord made me forget it, because had I not had had I not had to do it this way, I would have never seen the five interruptions that Hasatan, Satan, had, had uh, released toward this message. This is such a powerful message that Satan does not want anyone to hear it. Praise God that finally we have prevailed with the sound. It, it, and it just got paused again. It's happening again. I want the people to log in and I want them to come through because this has been through a lot of warfare. I remember when you were talking about Satan and exposing all the deception, even our YouTube video cut that out. Yeah, same message. I remember. Every time. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens with this one. I just had to blow my shofar because when when Satan hears the sound of the shofar, he has to flee. So before I log back on, I just reset. I blew my shofar to get rid of his influence. Can you do it again on live so that we just clear the whole atmosphere for the glory of God? This is not my good, my good shofar. Let's see if I can do it. Okay. pray to you lord we just we just bring the, the 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 spirits of heaven the ruach hakodesh down in both of our households lord and on this internet connection and on everything that is associated with this live broadcast lord in the name of yeshua in the name of jesus the messiah yeshua jesus the christ we evict any evil spirits from either of our homes and along any of these electronic devices, whether it be going through satellites, whether it be going through the air, whether it be going through our, our Wi-Fi, Lord. Satan, you have no authority in this house or in that house or anywhere between the two connections. 
So we say you, to, we tell you to be gone. Go to a dry place and never, ever come back. And certainly do not come back during the next 30 to 40 or 50 minutes. Bashem Yeshua Mishachene. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Woo. Let's let's go on with the um, the teaching because we we left out in the very height of it, and uh, I want you to take your liberty and take us to the next level now. All right. Well, tomorrow evening at sunset starts the second of the four of this of the Lord's feast of the Lord. Now, as I explained the last time. The Hebrew is much, much more descriptive than any English translation. Now, we read in Leviticus 23.2, it says, Moadi Yehovah, Mekra'e Elechem, Asher, I missed the word in there, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's Moadi Yehovah Asher Kadosh Mekra'i Alechem Moadi. What this says is it's Moadi. These are appointed seasons, Yehovah of God, of the Lord. They are holy convocations and they are exclusively His. Now, if you're going to be going all over the internet today, go into any public, uh, uh, read any of the, the newspapers, talk about or go on TV, they're all talking about this is the holiest day for the Jews. No, this is the holiest day for the Lord. Amen. These are the Lord's feasts. And it's very, very specific. And I'm going to take you a little bit deeper into that so that we actually understand exactly what's happening on Yom Kippur, which translates the feast, uh, with, uh, the Day of Atonement. Now, the proper name of this is Moadi Yehovah, Ha Yom Kippur, the Lord's appointed season and the Day of Atonement. Now, the church wrongfully teaches that Jesus came and fulfilled every aspect of this feast. He only fulfilled the animal sacrifice and the sacrifices for the personal sins of those people who accept Jesus, who accept Yeshua, as his personal, as, as their personal savior. Mm. For the rest of humanity, it has a totally different meaning, but because there's no temple sacrifice, and because the King James Version, the New King James Version, the Modern King James Version, the NIV Version, and uh, I think the ISV Version, don't translate the Hebrew correctly, it is misunderstood. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of the Bibles do translate it properly. I'm going to talk about that. But let me, let me just read what it says in the English translation so that you can kind of understand the Hebrew translation into English and where it gets watered down. If we read in Leviticus 23, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. Now, you have to understand, the children of Israel in the wilderness were, were almost four million people. So when we're talking about a congregation or an assembly, we're talking about a large assembly. Think of it in, this, in these terms. We're thinking about the entire believing church body without denominational separations. We're talking about all God's believers because the, the Gentiles, Paul says very clearly in Romans 11, 11, he says the, the Jews were not forgotten, or, but they were partially blinded so that the Gentiles could be grafted into the olive tree. That's all of the church. So when we talk about a large assembly or mekra'i, hakodesh, a holy assembly, we're talking to the entire believing community. Jews who believe, Gentiles, Christians, the entire group, if Jesus is your Savior, if you've accepted him, you're the person who we are talking to. You're the person who the Lord is talking to in Leviticus 23, 2. He says, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Well, you're part of that group now. And say unto them, 
The, these are the appointed seasons of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy assemblies, holy convocations, hakadosh, mekraya hakadosh. And these are my appointed seasons. They are Moadi Yehova. And it's so important, he repeats it again two verses later in verse 4 of Leviticus 23. All right, so Paul even confirms this because Paul, if we read in Colossians 2.17, he says, these are a shadow of the things that were to come, and the reality, however, is found in the Messiah. Messiah in Greek is Christ. As I mentioned, I think I mentioned last time, that's not Jesus' last name. That's his title. Amen. Okay? Amen. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Now, I also mentioned last time that there are nine feasts of the Lord. There's one weekly feast, the Sabbath. And I'm going to talk about this today because it has relevance to what I'm going to be teaching on today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I am going to explain to you how the church has actually changed that day mm. or that day of the week. That's found in Leviticus 23.3. And then I also said there's eight uh, annual feasts. Four of them occur in the springtime. Four of them occur in the fall time, in the fall. Now, when Jesus first came, he fulfilled all of the spring feasts prophetically. Now, again, for those of you who are, did not listen to the last uh, YouTube live, and if you haven't, I suggest you go back to it or go to my website, uh, my my Facebook Live, or go to my YouTube. It's Rosa Sharon Ministries or Rosa Sharon MN. And I have a separate uh, Facebook page for my ministry. And I have a YouTube channel under that name, Rosa Sharon Ministries MN or Rosa Sharon MN. You can find it. But he did fulfill the spring feast when he came. Uh, he's going to fulfill the fall feast. And the word Moadi, which is God's appointed seasons, has a root word, a two-letter root word, like all Hebrew words. They have a root word, usually three, but sometimes two. Uh, the, and uh, the root word for that is ed, which means until. So it tells us from the meaning of the root that these are prophetic times of the year. All of the feasts of the Lord are prophetic. Now, the first time he came is the Passover lamb, fulfilling the sacrifice required for Passover. I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but I did mention last time that the there is only one sacrifice that was ever required for Passover, and that was the one in Egypt, and then the second one occurred on the cross at Calvary. So that is the only two sacrifices that were ever, ever given for Passover. When they came the first time, he was, he was unleavened. Leaven is a word that is used throughout Scripture for a symbol of sin, so he is unleavened. He fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he also came as the first fruits of the resurrection, fulfilling that feast, which is the first day of the week following the Passover, which incidentally, four times out of five, always falls on Easter Sunday. The only time it doesn't is in a Hebrew leap year because the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar, not a solar cal calendar. And seven times every 19 years, an extra month is added. So those seven times, it does not line up. But all the other 12 times, it does. All right. And his first appearance, he also sent his helper, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Amen. Uh, on the Feast of Weeks, known in Hebrew as Shavuot which, Shavuot, which means weeks, and in Pentecost it means 50 days, which is seven weeks plus a day. Now, I introduced the prophetic meaning of the Fall Feast the last time, and they were, one, when he comes, he will fulfill the rapture of the church and the believers. He will, he will rapture us. He will judge believers and non-believers. I'm going to talk about that in a lot of detail because that's what this feast is all about. And he will claim his bride. That'll be on the Feast of Tabernacles, which uh, starts on the 22nd of the month. And I'm actually doing two teachings. I'm actually doing three teachings, but I'm going to try and compress them into two sermons uh, starting next week. And uh, he will reveal the New Jerusalem with the, uh, the Garden of Eden and, of course, the Tree of Life, which has been hidden since Adam and Eve have been expelled from the Garden of Eden. Now, Yom Kippur translates into the Day of Atonement. 
Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the church wrongly believes that Jesus fulfilled this feast at his first coming. He only fulfilled part of it. Now, this occurs, it starts tomorrow evening at sunset and ends at sunset on Wednesday, the, tw the 19th. Now, this is actually the only one of all of the feasts of the Lord that Israel only celebrates on one day, whether you're in the dispersion or you're not. It's the same year round. It is the most holy day in Judaism because they don't accept Jesus as their Messiah and they don't understand it. However, there are some other elements that I'm going to talk about. You see, we read about the Feast of Yom Kippur in Leviticus 23, verses 26, 27, and 28. It contains the Lord's instructions. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, How be it on the tenth day of this month is the day of atonement, and there shall be a holy convocation. Now I want to understand, I want you to remember that that comes from Leviticus 23, 2 and 4. It's Mekrae Hakodosh. Now the word mekrae, which also translates into convocation or assembly, we're talking a large assembly, like the size or larger of the Israelites in the wilderness, 3, 4, 10, 15, 20 million. We're talking about all believers, but it also has another meaning. And the meaning to that is that it is a rehearsal or a practice of a time to come. So you, you couple that word with the root word for a Moadi, mm. me again. It happens every time when I give this lesson. I hope that I hope didn't lose any of my my instruction. But we are good. I can hear you. I know it's cutting a little, but I can hear you. Glory to God. That's what happens. We evicted him, and he's still in the wires. Every time I try and give this la this sermon, I get interrupted. So, at any rate, just back up just a little bit. Uh, holy convocation rehearsal. That's where you are. Okay, the holy convocation. It is a rehearsal. The other meaning of the Hebrew is it is a rehearsal. It is a practice. Now, since the spring feasts were all come, uh, have all been fulfilled prophetically, we have to, we have to witness to the world that that's happened. But what about the fall feasts? The fall feasts, since they have not been fulfilled yet, we are to observe them as holy convocations because we need to also witness to the world that these are prophetic and that they will be fulfilled when Jesus returns again. It goes on in Leviticus 23, uh, verses 26, 7, and 8. It says, there shall be a holy convocation, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall bring an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So there are three parts to this, but let me continue with verse 28. It says, and you shall do no manner of work in that same day, for this is an atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord. Now, I'm going to explain the you here because that's a little different, uh, different in Hebrew. Now, there are three parts to this instruction. One, afflict your soul. That's fasting. And we're not talking about a partial fast or a Daniel fast. We're talking about a full fast. No food, no water. God wants us to afflict our soul. Now, when we are fasting, what, do we, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to commune with God. That means we should be in the Word. We should be praying while we are fasting. That has not changed, and in, in, in rabbinical Judaism, that's exactly what's going on. Mm. The second part is do no manner of work. That means it is a Sabbath rest. Now, I'm not going to get into the three different definitions of Sabbath, but I'll give you two. One is a Sabbath day, and the other term that's used for Sabbath is just a period of rest. Now, the reason we rest is so that, again, we can commune with God. We don't want to be distracted doing other things. We want to have this time of a, a solemn time of fasting and praying and communing with God. Now, the third part is to make atonement before the Lord. Now, this has been fulfilled by Yeshua, by Jesus, on the cross on his first coming. But the other two-thirds, remember, I said there are three parts. So, uh, afflict your souls, uh, have a Sabbath rest, 
And then the third part, of course, is make a atonement by fire. We can't do that. There is no temple, and it's not necessary these days. But there's more. If we read in Leviticus 16, if you're trying to keep up with me, if you can quickly turn to Leviticus 16, it's one of the reasons I use an electronic Bible, because it's faster to get there, uh, especially when you're using uh, uh, thin pages. Leviticus 16, verses 7 and 8, it says, And he, now this is referring to Aaron, shall take two goats and place them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. By the way, uh, we uh, took some people yesterday down to the tabernacle experience in Albert Lee at the, uh, at the fairgrounds there. A magnificent experience. They're there until the 23rd of the month. Uh, if, you, if you have time, I encourage you to go and, uh, and experience the tabernacle experience while it's here because it's going from here to, to San Jose. Mm. You do have to register, though. Because it, because it's uh, you're staggered as you go through it, but I would recommend going to the Tabernacle Experience at the Freeborn County Fair. Just Google Cab Tabernacle Experience, uh, Minnesota or Albert Lee, and if you have time, I, I I encourage you to go. At any rate, continuing with Leviticus 16, 7, and eight, it says, "And Aaron shall put lots upon the two goats, one lot for the for the Lord, and the other for Azazel." Mm. I'm taking this from the Jewish Publication Society, but I've already told you all of the King James versions, regardless of which one, uses the word scapegoat. They change the word because of the what they believe the meaning of the word is. That's how dictionaries work. So they've taken the free the, the term Azazel. These the, these lots, one of the lots is placed on Azazel for a very very specific reason. I'm going to show you in a little while why the Christian church doesn't understand this. Wow. Some Bibles say scapegoat, as I just said. So now it goes on in verse 16, 11. Now it says in 16, chapter 16, verse 11, it says, And Aaron shall bring near the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and, kill, and he shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Now, I'm using this from the Leeser Bible, which is one of my two favorite Bibles. It's a non-believing rabbi that translated the Masoretic Hebrew text into English for Americans to actually understand. Now, I want you to understand. I'm going to read that again. Aaron shall bring near the bullock. That's a bull, a male bull, of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall make atonement for himself and for his house. In ancient times, when there was an altar to make an animal sacrifice, it had to be done. Now, the high priest, in this case it's Aaron, the first high priest, it's for the, him to cleanse himself and his family before going into the Holy of Holies. That's the inner part of the tabernacle. Because you must be completely clean and sinless. So this, the bullock is for him and for his household. Now, then it goes on, and it says, And he shall kill the goat for the sin offering that is for the people because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in their sins. However, this is for the communal sin of Israel. It is not for individual sins. In ancient times, the Israelites still had to make sin offerings and sin sacrifices on the altar for their individual sins. But this is for the communal sins. Think of it this way. These are the cultural sins. These are the sins that the government forces upon us, our culture, our environment, uh, our school systems, the indoctrination of the, of the culture. These are the sins for the community. For the community of people, the larger community, not for individual sins. It's very, very specific. There's a specific Hebrew word for that. The Hebrew word is uba'ad bayeto. This is for communal sins. This is not for individual sins. Individual sins would be kol lakol. This is for uba'ad bayeto. This is so the Hebrew is extremely descriptive when it says when it for the people, but he but it's not for the individuals. I want you to understand that. Now, 
the first goat is also sacrificed for the communal sins, for the transgressions, asher la'am, community of the Israelites. This is for the community, asher la'am. Wow. All right? While every English translation says that this is for the people, the Hebrew clearly says that the sacrifice is for communal, communal sins, not for individual sin. Powerful. I understand that. That's powerful. Now, if, yeah, amen. I'm glad you understand that. Leviticus 15, or 16, uh, verses 15, the second half through Leviticus 16, 16, instructs Aaron, now listen to this, to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and to cleanse the Holy of Holies. And then in verse 17, he tells that there shall be no man in the tent of the meeting when he goeth in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and makes an atonement for himself and for his household and for the assembly of Israel. Again, communal sins. Now, if we go back to Leviticus 16.10, God told Aaron, but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be set alive before the Lord and make atonement over him to send him away for Azazel into the wilderness. This is the Jewish Publication Society. This is not the King James, because the King James doesn't even use the word Azazel. So listen what's happening here. The second goat is not to be killed, but the sins are to be put on the horns of the second goat. It goes on in Leviticus 16, 21. It says, Aaron shall lay both hands on both of his hands upon the head of the live goat with the blood of the bullock and of the first goat, and confess over him all the inequities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, transgressions, even all their sins. But again, not individual sins, communal sins. That which the community, the uh, assembly, the congregation has been essentially forced to sin because of the culture. Now, you gave a sermon the other day on on uh, the uh, worldview, the Christian worldview versus the world worldview. Well, this is the world worldview. This is what we're talking about. It exists today. I mean, we have Roe v. Wade. We do, we've, uh, the government's taken Bibles out of the schools. I mean, uh, and look what's going on in the rest of the world where Christians are being killed. So this is for the communal sins of all the people that are believers. And Israel, of course. And then he says, and he shall put it on the head of the goat, and he shall send him away by the hand of an appointed man into the wilderness. In other words, there's a witness that goes with him. This is Leviticus 16.21. But remember, the goat's not supposed to be killed. You see, in Le Leviticus 16.21, it's referring, as I said, to all of the children of Israel. But in verse 21, we have a different verse. It says that it is kol kol. This is referring to individual sins now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to switch. So the word coal is used twice, and, and in order, uh, and in order for the reader to understand that this is these are now individual sins of the community on the live goat. Mm -hmm. So the communal sins are on the dead goat, and they're put on the live goat along with all of the individual sins. They're transferred now. The goat shall bear upon him all the inequities unto the land which is cut off, and he shall let the goat go into the wilderness. Uh, now, the Hebrew word of, of Kippur, Yom means day. Kippur means atonement. But as I mentioned earlier, every single word in Hebrew has a root word. Kippur is a three-letter root word is, is of itself, but it's usually used in order to get the U sound in, in the word or. It actually often just adds a dot or it adds a vav. It adds a fourth letter to the word. So it has a three-letter, a pure three-letter word, root word. It's called kafar. Now, the word kafar actually means to be covered. So many pastors preach that the sins were covered, but they weren't forgiven. In that respect, they are correct. However, there's more to the story. See, all right. See, not being familiar with the historical books, which are actually mentioned in the Bible or quoted in the Bible, 
most pastors and teachers have no, Christian teachers have no idea of what this means. It leads them to conclude that this is the end of the story, but it is not the end of the story. It has a plan that has been intentionally, that is intentionally hidden from Christians by the early church, excuse me, and let me repeat, repeat that. God has a plan, but it has been hidden from the Christian churches because of the early church, Christian church leaders. And it's contained in these omitted books. If you've been paying attention to any of my teaching, the, the uh, Vatican's actually taken 22 books out of the canon since it was canonized. Wow. Okay. You see, God's plan has always been to punish the original perpetrators of the sins of mankind on the day of the Lord. Well, what's the day of the Lord? That's the day when Yeshua, when Jesus will judge everyone when he returns. So who's getting punished for the sins? You see, God tells Aaron to tell the people that they are not, that they are not to be punished for the sins which Azazel taught humanity. Azazel is one of the 200 leaders of the fallen angels that came down with, with Hasatan, with Satan. God's going to punish the one who is responsible for causing the people to sin. Mm. The goat is not to be killed because individual sins and communal sins were transferred to the second goat. The, in the uh, communal sins were transferred by virtue of the blood, which is sacrificed from the first goat, and then all of the individual sins are also placed on this goat to be sent into the wilderness. Now, we read in Leviticus 17.11, it clearly says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and God says, I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes the atonement by life. This is, again, the Jewish Publication Society, one of my favorite Bibles. So, since the second goat was not sacrificed, the sins were not forgiven. They're still carried on by the second goat. And not only do Christians not understand why the second goat was not sacrificed, Jews today don't even understand it either, because, you see, they don't read Scripture. They rely on the liturgy that rabbis deliver in their on the sabbath and on the ho on their holidays uh, and the rabbis use the talmud what is the talmud think of it as the commentaries mm. on the scripture so they teach from the commentaries but it's not scriptural itself it's what they think the scripture is saying or how they are justifying it in their philosophical discussions and groups. I'm not going to get into how that actually works. But I'm sure you've heard the term. Maybe you haven't. Two Jews, three opinions? Well, that's essentially where it comes from. <laughs> There's always another opinion. All right. So at any rate, we read in Matthew 24, 37, it says, when the Son of Man comes, it will be the same as what happened during the, no during the times of Noah or in Noah's time. I'm using this version from the easy reading version, ERV. All right. So what does it actually mean? All right, let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verses 12. And we'll skip a few verses. And we'll also go down to verse 15. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star. Now, O day star is translated by Jerome in Latin as Lucifer. Mm. But what's really interesting is in Hebrew, you know what Lucifer's name is? Hillel. The same word, the base word that we get hallelujah from. Yeah. Because he was a worship leader in heaven. Got it. Okay? But his Hebrew word is Hillel. The Latin, the Latin word is Lucifer. It goes on to say, How have you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How you are cut down to the ground. And then it skips down to verse 15. It says, You are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. Now, what does Sheol mean? Or Sheol is the way it's actually pronounced in Hebrew, Sheol. Uh, I, I sometimes uh, go between between Yiddish and Hebrew because, uh, and the accent is different, but the language is similar uh, or the pronunciation is similar. See, most people believe that Sheol is hell. 
That's incorrect. Sheol is a holding place until some future date when judgment will be delivered. When Jesus Sorry, someone was trying to message text, uh, message call me. Sorry about that. I forgot to block my messages. Uh, most people, as I said, they think that Joel is hell. When Jesus went down to hell and took the keys from uh, from Satan, from from the devil, okay, where did he lock them up? He locked them up in Sheol. Yeah. yeah. It's a holding place until when? The day of the Lord, when Jesus come back and going to judge sinners and non-sinners. All of humanity is going to be judged. Mm -hmm. We read in Revelation 12, 19. I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail when we get into the Feast of Tabernacles. But in the first part of Revelation 12, 9, we read, And the great dra dragon was, was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And he was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This is the Engel Standard Version. We read in, in Revelation 12, 4, it says, His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven. The stars of heaven... Is a is a metaphor for the for the angels. So he took down a third of the angels and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. This is pertinent when we talk about the feast of tabernacles. I'll get back. I'll talk about this verse in a little more detail when we talk about that feast. So that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Think about what that says. Mm -hmm. The child is going to devour Satan. We're told about it right in Revelation twelve four. Okay, as I said, I'll be talking about it a little bit more uh, in, in, during the next two te teachings. But in the meantime, we don't find the answer to why Satan and his fallen angels are being held within the scriptures. We just don't know why that goat was put out into the wilderness and not killed. The question is why. As, as I said, the early church has divorced itself from its Hebraic roots. Now, this is the part that... Absolutely, this is where I'm expecting the evil one to cut us off. This is where he always cuts us off because this message he does not want this message to get out. In the last in the last lesson, I stated that the Emperor Constantine, in order to unite the Roman Empire under one religion, Christianity, he changed the Sabbath day to the Lord's Day, Sunday. He placed the change it from the seventh day, which in the modern calendar is Saturday to the first day, which in the modern calendar is Sunday, and eliminated any Jewish or Hebrew from the new one world religion. And I'm going to I use that specifically because in ancient times, the Roman Empire was considered to be the world leader, and the emperor was considered to be godlike. So Constantine wanted to, wanted to, uh, organize the entire Roman Empire, get rid of all the pagan religions under one world religion. Sound like something that the United Nations is doing now? Come on now. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, the one world religion. I, can talk, I could talk about that in a little detail, but not today. The following is the English translation from a document which made that official. Now, the document was actually introduced at the first ecumenical council in 325 CE. There's, you've got your, your cultural or your, uh, uh, what do we call it? Um, uh, your cultural influence. They, they, they eliminate AD after the death of Jesus, after the death of Christ, common era. All right. So, uh, but anyway, it, it was introduced in 325. It actually, it was actually formulated two years earlier by the Bishop of Rome but it was official during the first ecumenical council. The document is entitled Concerning the Jews. And I want you to listen to this. It says, let us have nothing in common with the Jews. This is an English translation. Who are our adversaries? I'm going to repeat that. This is a founding document of, the, of Christianity. It says, let us have nothing in common with the Jews who are our adversaries. And then it goes on, avoiding all contact with that evil way, who after compass the death of the Lord, being out of their minds, are guided not by sound reason, but by an unrestrained passion, 
wherever their innate madness carries them, a people so utterly depraved. Therefore, this irregularity must be corrected in order that we may no more have anything in common with those parasites and murderers of our Lord. No single point in common with the perjury of the Jews. This is a founding document of Christianity. So they went on. So Christian yes. has been on the wrong all along, as far as this subject is concerned. As far as understanding the cultural and the history, and bringing and not bringing any of that forward into Christianity, yes. Wow. But it goes further. Okay, as I said. They changed the fourth commandment, eliminating the Sabbath day and replaced it with the Lord's day. Now, don't get me wrong. The Lord's day is in a very, very common, a very important day. It's in the early church. It, it, uh, it was a remembrance of the day in which the, our Lord and Savior was resurrected. Now, we just celebrate it once a year on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. But most people don't understand why the Lord's day Sunday is observed as the Christian Sabbath. But what's interesting is that doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture. And we're warned twice in Scripture not to change God's word. But there it is. They changed it. Now, they also went on and eliminated the second commandment. Now, you have to understand there are three different versions of the Ten Commandments. The Hebrew second commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. The Christian version says, you shall not make unto you any graven images. Essentially, they say the same thing. They're worded a little differently. In Scripture, you actually have the two together in, in Exodus 20. Okay? But they eliminated that. Well, why? Because Christianity observes idols. Mar Mother of Mary, all of the saints. They couldn't have that as part of their Ten Commandments. So they took it out. And then they added a Ninth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Because they felt coveting... Covetousness was such a sin that they needed to break it into two. And so not only so now they, they specifically said, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, is, it, is that an important theological position? Absolutely, but it's changed the word of God. Okay, this all came out of the early Christian church. And furthermore, of the 18 Jewish bishops in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem church, not a single one of them was invited to this or any subsequent councils. Now, the problem is that the, that the Council of Nicaea, all of these ecumenical councils, established the theological understanding of Scripture and later the biblical canon of the New Testament. So obviously, they did not want anything associated with the Jews to be part of the early Christian church. Church. They call these books pseudepigrapha, false theology, false teachings. Why? Because it doesn't go along with their theological belief or understanding or what they want Christians to believe and follow or understand. So it's been completely eliminated. So the question here is, where do we find these answers? Remember I said the church eliminated 22 books and eliminated 22 books from the canon or from the early Bible. There we go. We've interrupted again. Are we there? Okay, good. Okay. In these, these books, these books are mentioned in Scripture or quoted in Scripture. So the answers can be found in the book of Enoch, in the book of Jasher. Again, these are considered pseudepigrapha. And the book of Jubilees, which is part of, of Hebrew culture and in the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Bible, essentially. And then, of course, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Giants. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls predates Jesus, at least uh, most of them, by at least 80 years. So he was knowledgeable about all of this. He taught from all of these, but it's not carried forward into the Christian church. Again, in Leviticus 16.10, God told Aaron, but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be set alive before the Lord to make atonement over him, to send him away for Azazel into the wilderness. And the King James Version, the modern King James Version, the new King James Version, the International Standards Version, today's living uh, version, 
uh, the new international vision version, the today's new international version, they don't even mention Azazel. And these are the most popular Bibles that are used in churches today. They use the word scapegoat. So who or what is Azazel? I already mentioned him earlier. He's one of the leaders of the Nephilim. Now, there's a misunderstanding about Nephilim. Everybody thinks Nephilim refers to giants. That's partially correct. The term Nephal means fallen ones. Mm. Nephilim is referring to the third of the angels that fell with Hatzatan, with Satan. That also refers to the descendants or the prodigy or the children that were created when these fallen angels went into the daughters of men and created offspring that so happened were giants. Now, the book of Enoch says that they were 400 feet tall. The book of the Dead Sea Scrolls says they're 40 feet tall. One of them, an issue of the terminology. I don't care. We're not going to get into a discussion of whether they're 400 or 40 feet tall. We know that they were the descendants of the daughters of men, and they were somehow genetically created to be larger than life. But then again, all of the Creatures were also created by these fallen angels, genetically manipulating. That's why we have half man, half animals, and mythological creatures. You see, we read in the book of Enoch, chapter 8 1, and Azazel taught mankind how to make swords and knives and shields and coats of mail. Now, we're not talking about the mail that goes into your mailbox, we're talking about mail as armor. Metal. So, okay. So this is what, in, in the book of Enoch, it goes on in, in the book of Enoch, chapter 9, verse 6, it says, See then what Azazel has done, how he has taught all wickedness on earth and has revealed the secrets of the world which were prepared in the heavens. So he brought heavenly knowledge to earth. He taught humankind how to do things that only God was gave the angels the knowledge of. They still couldn't create from ex nihilo or from nothing. Well, actually, the real word, the Hebrew word is bore from within, but uh, ex nihilo is Latin, which means from nothing. So we go back to the Hebrew again. We use the word bore. God created everything from within himself, not from nothing. So the Latin is a mistranslation or misunderstanding. But these fallen angels had the knowledge of the heavens, and they taught some of that knowledge to humankind. We read in chapter 10, verse 4, it says, And the Lord spoke to, to Raphael. Raphael is one of the archangels. And he says, Bind Azazel, hand and foot, and put him in the darkness. Make an opening in the desert, which is Dudael, apart, and put him there. What is Dudael? Dudael is a kettle of God. It's a cauldron that is, is kept in, in the wilderness. Uh, another way to interpret it, it's a pit. Mm. So we read in the pit. Satan is held in a pit. So is Azazel. So are the other 200 leaders of the fallen angel. They're held there. And then it goes on until the judgment day. What is the judgment day? When our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the second person in the Godhead, will judge. But I'm going to tell you something that, with the reunity of the three parts in the book of Enoch. See, a lot of Christians... And, and Christian professors and, and theologians say, well, the reason these books are not there because it doesn't speak of God. Yeah, they do. And I'll show you this. <laughs> the book of Enoch, chapter 10, 8, it says, And the whole earth was defiled through the example of the deeds of Azazel to ascribe him all the sins. That's what this is all about, all the sins of humanity. This is why the second goat was not killed. The book of Enoch in chapter 55, listen to this closely, it says, Ye mighty, king, mighty kings who will dwell on the earth, ye shall be about to see my chosen one. Who is my chosen one? God speaking of the Son. As he sits on the throne of my glory and judges Azazel and all of his associates and all of his hosts in the, in the name of, listen to this, of the Lord of Spirits. We're talking about all the unity of the three parts of the Godhead right there in the book of Enoch, chapter 55, verse 4, where Yeshua judges, where Jesus judges Azazel and all of his associates 
for the sins of humanity. That's what this feast that starts tomorrow night is all about. Wow. Unfortunately, whew, so this, that's what it's all about. This is incredible. And um, I, I just, I'm running out of battery because I had to use my cell phone. But I'll tell you, this is so incredible. And I know there are many people with questions and comments are coming in. A lot of questions are being asked. And we are having very good people listening to us tonight. And um, we are very thankful, Brother Mike, taking time. And um, some people don't understand that Jesus quoted the book of Enoch. The New Testament quotes the book of Enoch 49 times. Yep, that's correct. People like uh, James, people like um, Paul, they, re they read the book of Enoch. They read these books we are talking about. So, um, like, we don't see any documentation in the Bible of the battle for the body of Moses, but we see Jude mentioning it very little, but... Yep. That's correct. That, I believe in the book of Enoch. Is it in the book of Enoch or where is that? The whole story of how the body of Moses was fought over, it is something that Jude had read. Uh, in, uh, it's also in the book of Jubilees. It's also in, um, it's in, uh, it's in a couple of books. I, I can't remember which ones. Yeah, and so... I, I I know tomorrow when we meet, uh, tomorrow again we're going to come back right around this time. And um, I know when we meet, you're going to take us a little further because tomorrow is the beginning, is the day of atonement, correct? That is correct. Starts at sunset tomorrow. Well, why don't you just pray for us before we go? And those of you who have questions, those of you who have comments, Continue making them. And Brother Mike is going to keep track of all these questions. And he is going to address them back to you. And also, I want you to join us tomorrow night. Brother Mike, pray for us before we go to sleep. Bashem Yeshua Mishachinu, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. We pray to you, Lord, Father in heaven, Lord. We just ask that everyone that is in the audience that is watching this now, that has, that will be watching it uh, over a period of time, we just ask that you enlighten them. You open their hearts, you open their minds to understand that God's story, God's message of salvation goes well, well beyond what we read in Scripture. It doesn't change your ability to be saved because everything you need is in the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. But in order to have an understanding, you need to understand it within its history and within its, its cultural context, Lord. And we just ask you to open the hearts and minds of everyone that is listening and will be listening, Lord. We ask you to uh, give them a, uh, a restful evening if they're in, the, in this part of the world where uh, it, evening has already come, Lord. For those people who are at daybreak, uh, uh, they're, they're just getting up, Lord. We ask you to bless them, Lord. And we ask you to, uh, to ask them, we ask you to make them Berean, have them check the scriptures because everything that is here is in scripture. It's just that it's not interpreted properly into the English language. We ask that you uh, just go with these people, go with everyone, Lord, man, male, female, uh, Gentile, Jew. I know we've got all kinds of people that are watching today until we come again, Lord. Lord, we ask that you place your turn your face toward them. You give the, give your turn your grace toward them. You uh, give you uh, you turn their countenance, Lord. You give them peace, Lord. The the scripture, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the scripture I just recited in Hebrew came from comes from number six, uh, verses twenty four, five, and twenty six. It's the Aaronic blessing. Until we meet again, Bashem Yeshua Mishafein, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you so much, Brother Mike, and all the best, all the good night 
for everyone. There are questions coming, and Brother Mike will be looking at them and giving you answers. We love you guys. Uh, share the video. Tell someone to watch with you. And good night. God bless. Thanks so much, Brother Mike. Amen. Amen. Bye now. Bye-bye.